Uh, you know, it's great to see you again. Uh, we miss you up here in Chicago. But uh, yeah, th thanks for the opportunity to do this. Um, you know, addictions is something that uh, I deal with a lot. So uh, my name is Sam Vadakar. I'm from the Chicago uh, Cathedral. Uh, I think my dad's watching this too from Paul. Um, but yeah, I'm a psychiatrist and I, I studied here in Chicago at uh, Rush University. I did my adult psychiatry fellowship uh, at Rush and did my child psychiatry uh, fellowship also uh, at Rush. And so, you know, I, I do now mostly veterans. I'm at the VA hospital in Chicago. Um, but I also do uh, see children um, on the side also in terms of uh, helping them with mental health type of issues. Um, so we're an inner city uh, VA. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you may work for the VA or know people that work for the VA. So we deal with a lot of substance use issues. And so this is something that unfortunately I've seen multiple, uh, multiple times a day. So you know, I, I made a PowerPoint just sort of keep things organized. I know Father Kevin said this is probably gonna be recorded. So uh, you know, we're gonna go a little bit into some of the science uh, of addiction then how to overcome it. Um, I'll try not to take too much time uh, with the science part of it, but I'll share my screen now. And uh, if there's any issues, um, you know, just let, I guess, Father Kevin know is hosting the meeting. So let me share uh, the PowerPoint and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so let's see here if I hit play. Okay, so, all right, so it looks like that's coming up. So that's me over here. Uh, so, you know, let's start off by basically defining you know, what is addiction. Uh, you know, ultimately it is a uh, brain illness uh, from how we understand it physically. It involves a compulsion uh, to do something or use something and sort of this com continued and repetitive use of whatever this item is, despite uh, sort of harmful consequences that can come up. There's usually this very intense focus on whatever the item is, whether it's drugs, social media, um, or other, other items that can be, uh, one can be addicted to. And ultimately, you know, it can take into the wrong extreme, can definitely take over one's life and take over whole family's life. Um, oh, hmm. I'm not, you know what, I'm not allowed to move on to the next screen for some reason here. Uh, let me try, try, try clicking on the screen again, just. Oh, there you go. Okay, now I need to, oh, one second. Sorry, some technical, now I can't get out of that. Sorry. Okay, there you go. All right, now does that show up? Yes, it shows. Oh, perfect. Okay, so now th these are just the basic types of addictions. I'm only gonna go over a few of them, I and mean, this is a very vast topic. Uh, this is something that could uh, take years to learn. Um, and so we'll start off with sort of just basic drug addictions, what we typically think of with the addictions, alcohol and illicit substances, including things like marijuana, which is a very hot topic nowadays. Uh, then we'll talk, um, I think what's more, maybe even more sort of interesting is behavioral addiction, such as like internet gaming, social media addiction, uh, pornography addiction. Uh, so, you know, just some of the basics of the science, right? Uh, how this works is drugs directly interfere with how neurons, these are the the parts of our body that communicate with one another uh, and how they sort of send and receive and they process these signals. And the, the drugs that sort of directly affect how these neurons are reacting to a certain stimulus that can come up. And so there's this idea called tachyphylaxis, and this is sort of a technical term, but uh, this term is very important for how any kind of addiction works or how it develops is it's this idea that there's a decreased response to a drug after its administration. So the first time you use a drug, wow, you feel great. Something uh, very positive happens. But then as you keep using it, you end up needing more and more of whatever the substance is, whether it's drugs or alcohol, to get that same type of effect. Uh, so you know, just briefly, uh, how things like such as marijuana or heroin uh, work, they actually, they're, how they are chemically, they actually mimic some of your body's natural neurotransmitters. And that's how it works directly. Whereas something like uh, amphetamines, commonly known as meth, uh, or a substance like cocaine, these actually cause your neurons to release these huge amounts of these neurotransmitters, which causes uh, this very high spike of, of, of response that comes from your body. And other things like opioids, you know, we hear about the opioid addiction a lot. Um, that's a, a, a big thing that we deal with a lot too. And this sort of disrupts other parts of the brain, such as this brain stem. And this brain stem controls uh, just very basic functions critical to life, like your heart rate, your breathing, uh, your sleeping. And so this is why opioids, you know, when uh, intoxication happens, it can be very hard to reverse it if, it does, if it's not caught in time because it will essentially stop your breathing. Um, and I, I'll give you just the basic neuroanatomy behind it, because understanding the brain, I think, is very important to understanding why addictions happen, why they continue, and why it can be so hard to get rid of addiction. So uh, top left, you'll see this word called nucleus accumbens. This is one of the parts of the brain. It plays a very central role in the reward circuit, meaning 
something happens, you get a reward out of it, and this is how uh, your brain sort of processes it. And there's two essential transmitters that work here, dopamine and serotonin, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. There's another part of the brain called the amygdala, and this is sort of the fear aspect of the brain. This is a part that uh, plays a role in like stressful feelings like anxiety, irritability, and just general feelings of unease. And this part of the brain is important because it plays a big part in withdrawal. So when someone's trying to get off of a substance, this part of the brain is activated a lot. And uh, this becomes increasingly sensitive with drug use, which is why withdrawal symptoms can happen. And we'll talk about the, some of the specific withdrawal symptoms as we go on. Um, the sort of big one is this idea, uh, the, the part of the brain called the basal ganglia. This is once again involved in the reward part of uh, the brain. Uh, it's involved in motivation. Uh, pleasurable, oh, sorry, pleasurable effects uh, of activities are processed in this part of the brain. And this is very important because this part of the brain forms habits, whether they're good habits or bad habits, such as, you know, I wake up every morning at 6 a.m. and I pray a rosary. If I do that every day for a long time, this is the part of the brain that sort of builds that muscle memory for that. But it can also be used for negative things, such as drugs, when they, in, or they overactivate this part of the brain. And um, is you get that tachyphylaxis idea where you end up needing more and more of a drug to get the same sort of reward in this part of the brain because the brain gets used to it. Uh, and this other one is the prefrontal cortex. This is a very, very important part of the brain. I'm gonna uh, devote some time to this too also in the upcoming slides. Uh, this is executive functioning. This is involved in like planning, problem solving, making all the decisions that uh, we have to really think for. Uh, and it exerts self-control over impulse. So this is an important part because this part of the brain is not developed. It's very hard to control our impulses. But this is also the last part of the brain to mature, which makes teenagers and young people very vulnerable to making bad decisions or poor decisions. And this is the part of the brain that can get uh, affected greatly if drugs get involved with this. Uh, so once again, I mentioned dopamine is a very important part uh, of the brain. Now dopamine is used for a lot of different parts of the brain. It's used for muscle memory, sorry, for muscles and muscle movement. Uh, so when you hear about things like Parkinson's disease, it's usually too little dopamine in the brain that causes your muscles to get very rigid, but too much dopamine is part of how drug addiction works. Um, and dopamine is one of those chemicals that helps reinforce behavior. So high amounts of dopamine when you do something good or something pleasurable gets uh, sort of released in your brain that reinforces a uh, behavior. And so the faster the dopamine is released, the more intense uh, the effect is of uh, reinforcing. Uh, other neurotransmitters, I'm just mentioning it here because you may hear about them in various topics. Serotonin, uh, this is a very important part for mood, uh, anxiety, because a lot of psychiatric medications like the antidepressants work on serotonin and regulates like your sleep and all of that. Uh, serotonin is in a lot of different parts of the body, not just the brain, um, but it's there also in addictions. And then glutamate, uh, it's involved in learning and memory. And these are all sort of tied together uh, in terms of how addictions um, play a role in our body. Uh, and I, I just put this slide up. This is a very commonly used slide across sort of all addiction PowerPoints or you know, uh, teaching in medical school or whatnot. And so this is the effect of drugs on dopamine release. And you don't have to worry about the specifics of it, but that orange line, that, that DA stands for dopamine. And if you look at any of these, whether it's amphetamines, cocaine, nicotine, and maybe with the exception of morphine right away, but the first three, you see a very large spike of dopamine. Uh, and so for amphetamines, you see that spike occurs within that first hour. It's a very quick increase. You're talking about a roughly a 10, 11 time increase. That's why meth or uh, amphetamines can be very addictive if it's not used properly. I mean, we use amphetamines for ADHD. So you may hear people that are taking these medications, but when you, you properly use a medication like amphetamines for a proper diagnosis, the risk of addiction is actually very, very low. Uh, it's not going to happen. When you misuse it, it you, you get issues with that. So cocaine works in the very same way. Uh, over the course of sort of the first two hours, you get a very high, uh, about three, 400 uh, percent increase in uh, the dopamine in the brain. Nicotine, same way. Uh, you look at the nicotine chart, it's usually within roughly the first 15 minutes, which is why getting off of cigarettes can be so difficult. Uh, morphine, same thing, you'll get an increase uh, in dopamine, but uh, a little bit longer time periods. So that's just to illustrate that, you know, how sort of how important dopamine is and how it works within the brain specifically. Uh, and this is also uh, an important slide. So this is actually the, these, these are MRI scans of healthy children uh, and teenagers uh, over the course of developing. And you'll see the red line in between the two brains and that one uh, essentially is to show uh, age, uh, meaning on the top left is age five and the bottom right is age 20. Uh, and if you look at the different colors, so the more color blue 
means a brain is matured. All the other colors, like the red, the yellows, the greens, that, those are parts of the brain that are developing. And I put two red circles in there at the age five on the top left and uh, the sort of right side on the top side. That, those red circles are where that prefrontal cortex area is. Uh, and that's important because what do we see here? We see that, well, that's, part of, that's one of the last parts of the brain that develop. Uh, whereas all the other parts of the brain develop. And this is why you might often see teenagers making very poor decisions because they don't have that executive functioning like we described. Uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex is responsible uh, for that part uh, of, um, uh, of the brain. So this is also used a lot in, when you look at sort of child psychiatry cases in terms of criminal justice. This is one of the reasons why uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that you know, kids may not always fully be responsible for their actions, even though they are still Response, they, they still have responsibility for their actions. There may be other aspects of the brain that are not fully developed. And when you start having drug use that is interfering with this development, you know, you may have less development of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so you just sort of to give another uh, way of looking at it, adults rely more on the frontal cortex area, whereas teens rely more on that amygdala, that area of sort of the gut feeling. Um, and so, you know, adolescents sort of think more with their emotions because why? The amygdala is just more developed in adolescence than the frontal cortex is. So just from a neurological standpoint, um, that's where the sort of their brain is firing more often than the other ones. Um, and so now, you know, let's look at, well, why do people get addicted, right? So, you know, the previous ideas all were, well, it's all a moral failing. If you try hard enough, you can stop any addiction without any help. Uh, or, you know, it's all purely uh, self, um, it's, it's all due to one person's own uh, volition. But biology, environment, development, you know, all these play a very significant role in it. And, you know, clinically, I could tell you this is a very important slide to understand, you know, how addictions really work for people. Uh, genes, your genetic, your genetic, genetic makeup make up about half your risk for addiction. Uh, that's a very important part. That's not 100%, but it's still not a low percent either. So just having a uh, family history of alcohol abuse, substance abuse, or uh, other kinds of addictions just naturally will increase your propensity to develop an addiction. It doesn't mean you're going to get the addiction for sure, but you have a higher risk of it. So you know, knowing that it's important because you can then reduce your uh, likelihood of you know, encountering those types of substances or avoiding those. Your gender ethnicity definitely uh, can influence that also. Then also mental illness. Um, I'm a psychiatrist, I deal with mental illness all day, every day, and you know, having higher rates of things like depression may lead for someone to look for drugs and alcohol to sort of quell that depression. Schizophrenics, for example, have a higher rate of using tobacco uh, to help sort of calm the voices is something that a lot of patients tell me. Uh, your environment uh, plays a very important factor also. So, you know, minus that 50% of genes that's out there, uh, you know, the environment's very important. Family is probably one of the most important ones. And I'll give you uh, an interesting uh, study that was done actually in Kerala that looks at this. Peer pressure is very important also. You know, who your kids are around, who you're around make a very important part of this. And to give you an idea, very, um, one of the main things that alcoholics, for example, do to get out of their addictions, they don't hang out with the same people that they used to because a lot of their friends were just drinking buddies and that's how they socialized. Uh, physical and sexual abuse. This is something that's not usually talked about too much uh, within the addiction um, framework normally, but you know, these are very important things because a very significant portion of people have gone undergone physical or sexual abuse. And when it's not properly uh, understood, when it's not properly treated, they, people can turn to the things like substances to deal with the stress and the worries uh, and the depression, all the, the soul wounds that come with that. Uh, stress and parental guidance, also a very important part of the environment. Now, you know, if you're constantly seeing your parent drinking, well, that's going to be part of what you're sort of seeing when you grow up. It may be more normalized or someone who doesn't see uh, someone who's drinking. Uh, development also, the earlier drug use begins, the more likely it is to progress to an addiction. And we'll talk about some of the statistics behind it. Um, and this is primarily a Malayali audience. So, you know, I had to talk about, you know, alcohol abuse specifically within Kerala. Uh, this is a very important part because you know, alcohol is just a part of Malayali culture. Uh, and to give you an idea, just to put some numbers to it, you know, Kerala had a record of 14,508 crore rupees of liquor sales uh, from 2018 to 2019. And this is a huge, huge portion of the Kerala government revenue, tax revenue. I think it was something around the lines of 85 out of 100 rupees of whatever's collected end up going for taxes or some form of uh, taxes instead of the actual price of the liquor itself. Um, and, you know, the state's estimated to have about 1.6 alcoholics. I think there's a roughly around 30 million people in Kerala. 
And of those 1.6 million alcoholics, 45% of them are chronic alcoholics. I mean, this is a very chronic problem. And you probably have seen it in different like WhatsApp groups. You'll have seen the pictures from like Indian papers about people social dis distancing at the uh, beverage companies or the, uh, what is the state bedco, the shops uh, out there. Um, and so th this is also a very important study. Uh, this was done uh, in 2016 in the uh, Journal of Drug and Alcohol Review. Uh, this is in, um, this, uh, these people, these researchers looked, uh, did a questionnaire of 7,560 students who were aged just 12 to 19. They're from 73 different schools from around Kerala. They use a very standard uh, questionnaire and that questionnaire also included uh, data that asked about alcohol use specifically. And so what, you know, what did this study find? It found that lifetime alcohol use, meaning any having any kind of alcohol exposure, was 23% among boys and 6.5% among girls. And that's for ages 12 to 19. And that's just within uh, Kerala, within these 7,500 students. So it's a huge, huge number. And the mean age of onset of alcohol use was 13.6 years. So even in Kerala, where it's difficult to obtain alcohol for a minor, this is still a very uh, common problem. Uh, and they also found that alcohol use usually comes before any kind of tobacco use or illicit drug use. So in a way, alcohol use is sort of a, a leading into these uh, sort of worse uh, drugs that are out there. Uh, and this part I found really interesting. Uh, you know, it's it found that most students reported initiation to alcohol use by family members in the context of family celebration. So it means that their first drink was given to them by a family member during a family celebration. Uh, you know, that's a very common thing that, you know, We've all seen uh, in parties uh, where we all go to, and this is an important uh, initiation point. And you know, learning to avoid it, I think, can be a very important uh, part of preventing some of these addictions. Um, marijuana. I'm really just going to go into detail about only marijuana relative to other substances, just because this is a very big issue. Uh, this is something that for every single patient I see, I always ask them about their marijuana use and. A very high percentage of people are using marijuana. In Illinois, it's legalized. I'm not sure about Texas or other states yet, but it's becoming more and more popular um, in terms of legalizing it. And people have this idea of quote unquote medical marijuana. And somehow they believe that, well, if it's medical, it has to be you know, good for you. It has to be natural for you. Uh, that's the absolute opposite of it. And there's a few different forms of it. Uh, it can go from like smoking, edibles, meaning you're eating it, uh, you're baking it into different things. And the intoxication from cannabis or marijuana comes from this um, molecule called tetrahydrocannabinol. That's THC for short. Uh, and to give you an idea of how much of an issue this is in the USA, this is a study from uh, the USA. And to, in 2018, they said 11.8 million young adults reported using marijuana in the past just one year. And so for 2019, when they asked eighth graders, they said 11.8% of, of eighth graders had any kind of marijuana use in the past year. For 10th graders, 28 percent and for 12th graders 35.7 percent had used any marijuana in the past year uh, th these are once again these are huge numbers these are not insignificant numbers and you sort of get the idea that as people go on as it's become a normal more normal part of society people stop seeing the dangers behind it uh, and a few important things to remember from a chemical perspective there's been an increased potency meaning how strong the marijuana is so to give an idea in the 1990s the average thc content meaning the intoxication effects of it's sort of the same as like what percentage alcohol, for example, the average THC content was less than 4%, but in 2018, it was more than 15%. Uh, so not only are we seeing more use in general, we're also seeing a higher potency within it. Um, and to give you an also the idea of it becoming more common is when you start having pe people who are using marijuana before the age of 18, that makes you four to seven times more likely to develop a marijuana use disorder than adults. Uh, and in total, about 9% of people of any age who use uh, marijuana will become dependent. Um, but 17% will become dependent if you start in your teenage years, which is a very common time where uh, people are using marijuana. You know, what does marijuana do? The THC gives you the sort of sense of euphoria, pleasure. Uh, but at the same time, this is something that very few people talk about. And having talked to patients who get this quote unquote medical marijuana from another doctor, they're never explained the, uh, the potential side effects of it. And you can have what's called a paradoxical reaction. That means you have the opposite reaction. You could have things like psychosis, hallucinations or delusions, meaning you suddenly start feeling like someone's after you. You start hearing voices. You have auditory hallucinations. You can have visual hallucinations. Uh, you start feeling like someone's bugging your apartment. And I can tell you, I've seen this multiple times firsthand uh, where people will say that, no, I, I swear to God, I'll use marijuana. 
but then suddenly they have a lot of other substances showing up in their urine drug screen. Uh, and also just marijuana by itself can cause this. And, and I, on the top right, I put a, just a headline <clears throat> that was back in 2018 and, and said like synthetic pot, I mean, synthetic marijuana that was tainted with rat poison at sick in hundreds around the country. And even within Chicago, I think about five or six people actually bled to death because the synthetic pot was being tainted with uh, rat poison. And this is not at all uncommon. A lot of people or drug dealers will use other compounds to make uh, the marijuana more potent so they get people to come back to them. Uh, and so this can be very dangerous on uh, multiple levels. Okay, so now we'll go into the uh, behavioral addiction part of it. Uh, internet gaming addiction, I brought this up mostly for people who are using this excessively. Um, and to give an idea, 160 million American adults play internet-based games. That's a huge portion. That's roughly half the population are playing some form of internet-based games. Uh, and you know, where it becomes an addiction is when you become preoccupied with it, when you start getting these withdrawal symptoms, when the game is taken away. You may have like sadness, anxiety, irritability. That's beyond what's maybe normally uh, expected. Uh, you get a, so this tolerance that we discussed with some of the other drugs. You need to spend more and more time gaming to satisfy the urge to get the game or the pleasure that comes from the game. Uh, a, a big one is you try to stop playing or reduce the amount of time that you're using on these games, but it's unsuccessful and you can't really quit gaming. You start giving up other activities or you lose interest in things you used to enjoy and you keep you know, using these internet games despite any problem. And you start lying about it. You start lying about how much time you're spending on these games. Uh, and you use these games to relieve uh, negative moods such as guilt or hopelessness. Uh, and you can, you know, risk jeopardizing your job or relationships due to gaming. Uh, and so you know, now on to sort of the big one, social media addiction, right? This is something that's not necessarily a formal diagnosis in this DSM, the Diagnostic Statistics Manual that we use in psychiatry, but this is definitely there. You definitely see it. Uh, happening. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because this is something that affects uh, pretty much everybody uh, if you're using any kind of social media. Uh, I'm going to focus more on Facebook because a lot of the studies are more done on that. Uh, and social media ultimately can influence your brain in harmful ways. Right? With any kind of technology that we see, the technology itself is fairly neutral. I mean, social media could be used in very positive ways following things like the zero vision, right? It's a way to connect the whole world with masses and good things. But for the most part, we're seeing this being hijacked by advertising, uh, by different ways of keeping you on the screen. Uh, and so addiction, once again, is going to be when you're using something compulsively, excessively, and you can't really pull yourself away from it. Um, and you become accustomed to scrolling through posts, images, and videos, and that interferes with other areas of your life. Um, you know, I don't use Facebook uh, at all. Uh, I, I think it's very bad for most people, unless you use it very properly. But if you look at how things are going, when you start scrolling through things, you're scrolling on your phone, you're going up and up, that screen never ends. New thing keeps refreshing, keeps refreshing, refreshing, and that's to keep you glued to the screen. So why? Because Facebook can say, well, this person is spending this much time looking at our ads so we could then sell ads out there. So it's this thing called, uh, I think it was user engagement is what they call it. And you know, Facebook is, I think, ju just under a trillion dollar company. These are, there's huge money behind keeping you glued to your screen. And so being aware of it is very important. So once again, like other addictions we talked about, that dopamine increases when you're using social media, when you start getting attention, when you start getting likes, when you start getting views for your post, right? You start returning to that original source for even more reinforcement. So, you know, the, the picture on the right sort of explains, right? You take a selfie, you post on social media, you get the likes, there's that dopamine surge. Then you keep going around and around and around. Uh, and, you know, this whole like thing, that's once again to draw people to be engaged into this. So, um, uh, this is one of my favorite slides because I think this really cuts to the chase of all of it. There, this guy named Bergen, he uh, developed this Facebook addiction scale. So it's not like a fully validated measure, but and this gives you a really good idea of any kind of social media I think this can be applied to. So number one, do you spend a lot of time uh, thinking about social media or planning to use social media? So you know, maybe a good example is when you're on vacation and you're taking pictures, are you spending more time thinking, about, well, how is this going to look on uh, Facebook? How many likes am I going to get for this? Am I going to try replicating a, a photo shoot that someone else did, right? Instead of, well, hey, I'm with my family. Let's just take a fun family picture to remember it. When you start thinking about, well, how is this going to look? I'm one of, I'm, should I wear this? Did I wear this before? Did I, put, did I wear this on another picture that I put up? Or did I wear this set of jewelry? You know, whatever it might be. Uh, number two, do you feel the urges to use social media more and more? Like, are you finding yourself just looking at these things more and more? Um, do you use social media, number three, to forget personal problems? Like, well, you know, I'm going through a difficult time, but you know what, forget my life. I'm going to put that aside, not deal with that problem. And I'm just going to be looking at uh, other people's life instead. 
Uh, number four, like we talked about with the other ones, uh, their addictions, do you try to reduce your use of social media, but you don't have success for it? So you say, you know, I'm not going to use uh, social media tomorrow, but you know, I end up doing it, right? So not being able to stop is a very important part of knowing if an addiction is building up or not. Number five, do you become restless or troubled if you're unable to use social media? Well, internet cuts out at your house, your phone battery dies, are you getting upset because you can't use social media? Uh, and then number six, do you use social media so much that it has a negative impact on your job or your studies? And as we go on, we'll see, well, what's next? The detrimental effects of social media. And th this comes from a study that was done uh, of Facebook users specifically. This isn't looking at other ones. Um, but, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. That's why I picked the two on the uh, right side. You know, you see the person on the left on the top picture, you know, well, they only got 16 likes or whatever. They look horrible because why the person on the right side has a lot more likes and loves and who knows what else other those symbols are. And then what is Facebook? You're sort of just feeding your ego. That's what that bottom picture uh, says. And so, you know, what, what did this study found? It found that Facebook users have a lower GPA, a grade point average, and spend fewer hours studying than non-Facebook users. I think this study also found that, you know, people who are using Facebook think that they're doing more studying than they actually are because they're using Facebook. Uh, and also they find that, you know, consuming large amounts of information about other people elicit the feeling of envy and ultimately envy becomes a sin, right? Uh, because you're learning more and more about other people. And so people who regularly use Facebook, they are more likely to agree that other people have better lives than them and that life is unfair. Whereas people who are more active offline, uh, who have more offline social life, uh, or have a more balanced view of people's lives. And, you know, ultimately, you know, what is Facebook? You're just putting up this idealized version of who you want to be or who you want other people to think you are. And it's essentially completely false. Uh, you know, we sort of make ourselves into, uh, you know, sort of these like semi-perfect angels uh, that most people are probably not. Uh, and there's also very sort of a link between compulsive Facebook use and relationship dissatisfaction uh, due to jealousy and surveillance behaviors. Uh, and, you know, this could take a lot of different forms. Like, oh, did you see what car he bought? I want that car. I'm not happy with, you know, my Mercedes E-Class. I want an S-Class. Or, uh, you know, this person got this jewelry or this kind of new, uh, sorry, so I want these new things, right? And it just determines, you know, or this person went on this fancy vacation. Now I want a fancier vacation than what I had before. So this, kind of, this constant comparison is going to lead to just unhappiness. Uh, and now we'll, you know, look into pornography. So, you know, as Father Kevin said, I teach 11th grade CCD and what we teach is theology of the body. And pornography comes up a lot because it is an addictive behavior. Uh, you know, a lot of people will try to say it's not. Once again, why? Because there's a lot of money behind it. Um, but internet pornography shares very basic mechanism with other types of substance addictions. Uh, so your viewing habits can be concerning in terms of pornography in general, you should not use it, but it, it can be an addictive type of behavior if you start finding that you're spending more and more time uh, looking at pornography or neglecting things like your responsibilities, your sleep, your self hygiene, uh, you feel guilty about the consequences of your viewing pornography. And that guilt is a good thing. You know, no one should ever tell you that not feeling guilty about something that you do is bad is a bad thing. You should feel guilty about the bad things that we do because it's our conscious speaking to us because we're geared ultimately for God uh, and all of that. And so you want to stop using pornography, but you feel unable to do so. You start feeling powerless with it. Uh, it lowers the quality of intimate relationships and uh, you know, it can lead to risky behaviors of viewing pornography such as at work and people getting fired uh, at work for this. Uh, and from, you know, just from a, just a rough Catholic perspective is, you know, well, what is pornography? Ultimately, people will say like, well, you know, it's okay. It's two people, no one's getting hurt. Uh, you know, everyone's agreeing to do it. But really, what are we doing? You know, we're objectifying someone else. We're using them as an object of lust instead of seeing them through the eyes of love that God you know, intended for us to see all of our, uh, you know, fellow human beings with. Uh, and now, you know, on to sort of this, the main part, you know, the topic of this is going to be overcoming addictions. As we see, there's a lot of ways in which addictions can build up, whether it's substance use, whether it's um, behavioral use. But now we want to talk about overcoming addictions. And I'm going to look at this very much from uh, initially a scientific perspective, but then moving into how uh, Catholics could view it and ways that they could help. Uh, now, one of the barriers to uh, overcoming addiction is this idea of withdrawal symptoms. So like we said, we looked at the neuroanatomy, we saw that different parts of the brain, especially the amygdala, were getting uh, sort of hit kernel in a lot with the drugs. And as they start getting activated, they start getting used to having this drug in their brain. And their brain starts restructuring itself in a very physical way uh, and needing these substances. And probably the deadly one in terms of withdrawal is alcohol. So alcohol withdrawal can be deadly. Uh, so, you know, anyone that says, well, this is just a chronic alcoholic and we're just going to throw him in jail for three days until he sobers up, that could be deadly. Why? Because your brain gets used to the alcohol. Uh, you start, you can have uh, 
anxiety, tremors, nausea, vomiting, uh, insomnia, sweatings, hallucinations. But the deadly one comes from seizures because the brain is, when you're using a lot of alcohol, you're decreasing your seizure threshold. Uh, you know, for anyone who's worked in uh, you know, any kind of medical ward or psychiatric ward, you probably know what the CWAS scale is. It's really just a measure of looking at all these different um, uh, features and saying, well, you know, someone experiencing this and how do we medicate it? And, you know, this needs to have a medically supervised detoxification because this can be deadly. Uh, whereas something like tobacco, marijuana, these are not deadly. Uh, even opioids, withdrawing from it is uncomfortable, but not deadly. So when you try to quit um, you know, tobacco, you get the cravings, nausea, tingling, coughing, depression, mood changes. Marijuana, a lot of irritability, mood changes. Same thing with the sleep, headaches, and sweating. Um, and so once again, these can all occur at different stages, but for severe alcohol withdrawal, this could start within eight hours. Uh, if you look at the top right graph, you know, that's a nice sort of graph of explaining. Even within eight hours after your last drink, you can start getting the anxiety and insomnia. Within one to three days, you're getting the high blood pressure and all that. And within, you know, day three, hallucinations, fever, and all sorts of things that could really uh, be problematic in terms of stopping withdrawal. So this is a reason why a lot of people may go right back to using, um, whatever substance they're using. And this is a very, and this is an important slide to understand from a psychological perspective. This is something called an extinction burst. Uh, so an extinction is when we try to get rid of something, when we try to stop a behavior, right? So if it's to the left of that line, you start to see that flat line going, that's just the initial behavior response. So that could be, I am smoking one pack of cigarettes a day, and then that line is gonna be where I'm gonna stop. Like that reinforcer would mean I stop taking cigarettes. Well, maybe for a little bit of time, it's okay. But then suddenly I start smoking way more because my body has these withdrawal symptoms. And you may have higher use than you were even using before. And a lot of people at this point, uh, clinically, I could tell you, will say, well, you know, it's better that I just use one pack a day instead of trying to quit because when I try to quit, I started using two packs a day, right? But you keep with it. You keep going with it. Your body slowly starts restructuring into it. And then eventually that extinction where you can quit successfully can happen. Um, so, you know, hopefully that gives you an idea of why someone may try to quit, but then suddenly start using more of it because it's, our brains are sort of wired for it from multiple perspectives, not just uh, physiologically from the brain structures, but also uh, psychologically. Uh, and so just some basic medical strategies to overcome addiction. So this is something where I do a lot of uh, just by virtue of the patient population we see. Uh, sort of the easiest probably is tobacco. Uh, there's nicotine gums and patches. Those are available even over the counter. So if you're trying to quit tobacco, it could be really hard because it's not just the nicotine. It's also the habit. I have something in my hand, something to do, something for my mouth to do. And so, you know, something that I, you know, I, I'll recommend as well. Great. We'll use nicotine gums and patches to help that nicotine withdrawal get better, but then have something in your hand to use. So use like a Twizzler or some kind of candy or use like a lollipop just so you have something to do because your body gets sort of uh, behaviorally activated with doing this uh, motion. Uh, some prescription medications, Chantix uh, and Bupropion could be used. We use it pretty successfully across the board. So you know, if this is something you want to quit, talk to a doctor. These are very easy medications to prescribe. Uh, some basic screening needs to be done, but it can definitely be helpful. I've seen it be helpful. It's worth trying. Uh, alcohol, like we said, can th that withdrawal, if you're severely addicted to it and your body develops a tolerance to it, that could be deadly. That is something you definitely want to talk to a doctor about in terms of seeing, well, do you need to go under medically supervised withdrawal? Not, not, I forgot the exact percentage actually needed, but it's not a high percentage, but it's still something that's severe enough where you wanna talk about it. But you know, quitting alcohol, there's medicines that can be helpful. Uh, naltrexone is a medicine that we use very uh, frequently. I've used it with a lot of success, success a lot, a lot of patients. Um, it really helps cut down cravings and people tend to like it. Uh, there's a lot of other medications out there that are sort of older ones that sort of make you throw up if you use alcohol. Those tend to not be as effective, uh, but there is hope for alcohol uh, addiction. But if you put your mind to it, it you know, and, and you use the right strategies, it can be helpful. Uh, opiates, things like uh, methadone, Suboxone, may, names may have come up before. Um, but this part is also really important. Uh, treating the underlying symptom, whether it's like depression, anxiety, insomnia, PTSD, this is really important because if you were using the substance, to treat an underlying problem until you treat the underlying problem, that substance use is going to keep going. And this is a part where I think it's really important to get the right type of mental health. Um, I always tell patients, you know, what is the drug doing for you? We always screen for us. I say, you know, everyone's using, a lot of people are using marijuana. Well, what's it useful for? Oh, it helps me relax. It helps me calm down. Well, then once you start treating the anxiety or it helps me sleep, once you start treating the insomnia, it makes getting off of these medications a lot easier. So having honest discussions with your doctor about it, being open and being humble enough to, you know, admit the problem, going to the right specialist can make this a much, make you a much higher uh, 
chance of being able to quit these uh, addictions. Uh, you know, just some basic psychological strategies. Um, and so CBT is called cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a very commonly used uh, therapy. This is sort of identifying a negative thought, like I'm feeling anxious, so I need to go to alcohol. It's sort of helping restructure that. I'm not going to go too much into it. I'm not a, a, a you know, licensed therapist, but uh, that is one of the psychological aspects out there. But I do want to talk about AA groups because I think this is very important. It's a nice transition to when we start talking about how as Christians we could you know, help ourselves spiritually overcome addictions. So AA groups, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, this was uh, developed years ago. And it's interesting because I, it would be difficult to say if this same group could have developed today with sort of this anti-God, anti-anything religious uh, attitude that's out there. But this is a very effective group. I have lots of patients who have been in it for decades who do well with it. A lot of people may have to go to it multiple times over, but you just keep on trying. And there's 12 steps, it's a 12 step program. And six of the steps mention God or a higher power. Uh, so for example, step two, right? As we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to stand sanity, right? Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, right? Step five, we admitted to God ourselves and to other human beings that the exact nature of our wrong. So we admit what we did wrong. Uh, and I've sat in you know, groups for alcoholics uh, for weeks in a row. And, it's a very powerful thing to see people break their addiction, but also sort of allow themselves to say, you know what, I can't do this on my own. I need other people's help, not only my family, doctors, but also God's help. Uh, you know, we are humble, step seven, we humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Uh, and, you know, we, uh, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve uh, ourselves and see ourselves sort of as God understood, you know, God as we understood him, praying for knowledge and his will for us and the power to carry it out. Uh, it's a very powerful group, and you know, it's, I'm very happy that you know the AA groups at least still continue with this. Uh, so it's an important part uh, as we go forward. Uh, and then just to you know decrease social media use, you know, there's not really a good medication sort of to help decrease this, other than if we're trying to treat the underlying problems. But uh, you know, some very practical steps I think could be helpful. You know, what is an app? An app just came up a few years ago. But you know, an important thing is delete the social media apps from your smartphone and use a website version instead. Ideally, just stop using it if you don't really need it, but at least delete the apps because what does the app do? It allows you to have one touch access to everything. Whereas with the website, you have to at least type in the website, you have to type in your login information, you have to hit enter, and you, you may not get the full functionality that an app would offer you. So deleting apps is a very easy way, of, you know, at least decreasing social media use, uh, turn off notifications. Like there's no reason in the world someone needs to know when someone likes their photo. Uh, that's just that bing, 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 that sound that keeps going off. Turn it off. If you feel like you can't turn it off, that may be a sign that you're using social media too much. Uh, limit time on your phone. You know, I think almost all the phones nowadays have some form of timer uh, on your phone that shows how much time do you use on each uh, app that you have or each website that you're using. Uh, and once you de decrease the social media use, the key is you have to replace that time with positive things that may help you grow. Uh, you know, things like learning new activities, doing things in real life uh, that, that can be really helpful. Uh, taking up volunteering activities to the extent that you can, you know, being present in your prayer life, being present with your family, doing things that are available to you uh, is going to be important because you have to replace the time. You can't just cut it out completely and sit there silently for an hour. That, you have a high risk of not uh, breaking that social media use uh, if you do it that way. But replacing things with positive things are going to be important. Uh, and so, you know, overcoming addiction spiritually, this is a part that you know, I think is very powerful. And I think as if you're listening to this, you have a higher chance of probably being Catholic than the normal population. So I think it's important to understand, well, you know, how can we use spirituality and Catholicism in particular to overcome these addictions? Uh, you know, these three pictures I put up for a reason, you know, ultimately, you know, what is the first commandment? I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. You know, when we're addicted to something, we're putting something higher than God, whether we're addicted to money, power, prestige, uh, you know, you name it, whether we're addicted to, I want the most likes on Facebook, I want to have the most friends, I want to be the most uh, known person uh, in social media, or, you know, we're putting, God, we're putting something else before our true uh, calling, which is to worship the Lord above all else, and everything is subservient to that. You know, a very simple way to say is, well, are you spending more time in prayer and quality time with your family in person than on social media? That answer should be yes. It should not be no. If the answer is no, there's more time on social media and all these things versus in-person interactions versus uh, spending time with the people that matter to you. That's something to look into. And we have to always remember, you know, Jesus came in the person, in a human person. He came in a body. He was tempted in all ways, in all types of sins. Though he did not sin, he was tempted. 
And then what do we see here in this middle picture? We see the devil tempting him when he was in the desert fasting for 40 days, right? Those are only sort of three specific temptations we hear about, but you bet Jesus was tempted by all sorts of things. Uh, you know, we see that he's called to well, make bread where we make food, uh, maybe more important than other things, right? What do we see next? We want him to, devil tempts him, throw him off the parapet, right? Be this magician worker, be the magic person that everybody's like, wow, look at this guy, look what he could do. Or versus, you know, well, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just bow before me. I want to be the most powerful, right? Whether that power is from social media, whether it's your president of the world, you name it, whatever it might be, those are temptations that Jesus Christ, that we know of, went through, and he helps us through these temptations. And on the right side, we see the prodigal son. Ultimately, what do we do? You know, addictions are a breaking of our true calling to be children of God. You know, we confess, we go back to Christ, and he restores us to that grace. Um, and this part, I think, was very, uh, very important. You know, this is not something that the Catholic Church is blind to, right? This is Pope Francis' statement, I think it was in 2018, to the participants in the International Conference on Drugs and Addiction. This is the actual picture where he developed, uh, where he delivered this uh, address, right? This is happening in the Vatican. This is happening right at the heart of Catholicism. And what did Pope Francis say? His own words, he said, drug addiction, as, it, as has often been pointed out, is an open wound in our society. Its victims, once ensnared, exchange their freedom for enslavement to a dependency that we can define as chemical. And yeah, I, I like the chemical part because he even acknowledges the science behind it. Uh, and he then further went on to say, an area of increasing risk is virtual space. On some internet sites, young people, and not only the young, are lured into bondage, hard to escape, leading to a loss of life's meaning and at times even of life itself. Now you hear about different things. I think it came up in, um, Carol, a few years ago, this whole blue whale game and all these other sort of things that are out there that are just trying to trap you uh, into staying on your phone, staying away from this true companionship and this true relationship that uh, God wants us to have. Uh, and so there's a lot more if you're interested. In it. Uh, and this is another, I think, an important part. You know, it, a lot of us probably work in healthcare. And when you think about the risk of infection, right, a needle stick injury, well, what is a needle stick injury? We all try to avoid it. Is even a little bit of a little bit of blood, even less than a drop of blood punctured into your skin that you come in contact with could then give you that same illness. Just a little tiny drop of blood can cause you to get HIV, hepatitis, you name it. It could happen. And if that little drop of blood, that's just a human drop of blood, could cause a lifetime of misery. Imagine what one drop of Jesus' blood could do for us if we truly come to believe, if we truly come to the sacraments, right? Jesus' blood is what saves us in a very real sense because addictions wound us, not only physically, like we talked about the neurochemistry of it, but also spiritually in our souls. Um, in a way, and this, you know, this is sort of a slightly on topic, but off topic. If you listen to some of the Catholic exorcists, I think it was Father Gary Thomas or Father Vincent Lampert of the Indianapolis Diocese, he mentioned he deals with a lot of exorcisms and he mentions about a lot of the drug dealers that came to him for exorcisms. And what do they tell, what do they tell him? They consecrate their drugs before they ship them from around the world into the United States. They consecrate those drugs to the devil. Why, why would they do that? Because it's the opposite of what we do for a blessing. When I had Father Kevin bless my house. Well, why do we have a priest bless our cars, our house? Why do we have baptism? Because we want good things to come from those. We want the power of God to give us good things. What if I'm a bad person and what I'm doing is bad, but I want that bad thing to be successful? Well, you consecrate it to the devil who will do the bad things and who will make those things happen. So it's a very real uh, spiritual battle that's also there uh, in addition to just the physical battle that's there. Uh, and you know, remember, we're made in God's image and addictions try to disfigure that. It tries to make us seem something that we're not. And you know, what does the antidote for the, the antidote for the spiritual wounds? You know, we have to ultimately, we have to come to confession. We have to allow that grace of God to come into our lives. And I have to say that middle picture of Pope Francis confessing, I think that's one of the most powerful images that one could ever think of. Even the Pope confesses. That means, you know, even us as flawed as we are, have to go to God have to keep going back. Even if you fall a million times, God's going to keep forgiving you if we have a truly repentant heart. And, uh, you know, overcoming addictions is a struggle, but it's a fight that God is with us and he never gives us a temptation that we can't handle. Uh, that part's very important. It may seem impossible uh, to overcome an addiction, but God gives us uh, that grace and gives us that ability to overcome it with patience and humility. Uh, and in this part, I really like this. The Venerable Fulton J. Sheen, um, He's one of my heroes. He's a wonderful priest. And if you ever get a chance to look him up, read about him, look him up on YouTube. He's got wonderful talks. 
And this is one of my favorite quotes from the many readings I've done of him, because I think it, this talks about really the difficulty that war we have within ourselves when we try to fight addiction. Uh, he said, our blessed Lord did not bring a cheap peace. As a matter of fact, God hates peace in those who are destined for war. That is why he said, I, come, I came to bring a sword the sword that the Lord brought is a sword that is pierced inward against ourselves. This was the sword that he brought. So, you know, if you're fighting addiction against, if you're fighting a struggle against addictions of any kind, whether it's physical, behavioral, social media related, you have to turn that sword inward to yourself and cut out those temptations, cut out the reasons that you're being addicted to these things. And those reasons, uh, once you cut those out, will then give you that freedom to use that same heart, that same energy for something positive. You know, it's not easy. This is, this is going to be a fight. It can be painful physically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, socially, but it can be done with the right sort of medical help, the right psychological help, and the right uh, spiritual support. Um, and then, you know, the wounds to heal. I, I deal with a lot of veterans, and, you know, the one thing that I you know, would say is that you hear a lot of PTSD. A lot of people are using drugs. Why? Because they're having horrendous nightmares of explosions, of horrible things that they had to do, of people bleeding out. You know, children, I, child psychiatrists, you know, how often children are abandoned by their parents or abused by people who turn to these drugs, who turn to these drugs to heal the wounds, right? Ultimately, uh, you know, people also then turn to social media for validation. If I'm not getting that validation at home, my parents aren't showing me the proper love. If I'm not getting that validation from my friends, well, I'm going to go look for it elsewhere. Uh, why? Because our hearts desire that, right? That's what we're meant to do that in healthy ways. Um, and, you know, the, the, when you deal with these things, you're trying to deal with this idea of emptiness, of not being worthy of love, of difficult family relationships that can break a lot of things. And, you know, these are the wounds that we have to come to know. We have to come to know the wounds psychologically, physically, but also spiritually. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, we have to always remember, you know, God loves us for who we are and wants to set us free from anything that binds us. You know, God, God is always there with us, whether we're sinning, whether we're not. He's there. He's there to help us. All we have to do is ask for it. Um, and you know, in hope for overcoming addiction, you know, I have to say these are some very, uh, very interesting things. You know, I, I think you know there's this idea of this divine sense of humor. I, you know, I heard that from one of Venerable Fulton J. Sheen's talks, and you know, I have to say I think this is a very powerful thing. If you want to have hope, which is a very important thing for addictions, is this idea of this divine sense of oh, the typo, sorry, divine sense of humor, and that God can take a weakness and make it a strength. What did God ultimately do? He took the cross, a sense of torture, of Roman persecution, and turned it into our life. He turned his death into our life. So that sense of humor that God has, not in a way that's funny, but in a way that God can take something that immediately seems one thing and turn it into something else. And I, you know, I bring, I bring up uh, Father Don Calloway. He's right here on the bottom left. He's holding up the rosary. Very powerful story. Just type in Father Don Calloway on YouTube and hear his talks. He's got amazing books. He has probably one of the best books on St. Joseph and the rosary uh, that you can look up on Amazon and buy. I, you know, I've read them. They're wonderful. Uh, he talks about his struggle with addiction horrible addiction. For, he had, his mom had married multiple times. He was, uh, you know, he was actually an international criminal with the, uh, I think it was the Japanese mafia. And he talks about his power, the power of the rosary, the power of his conversion and getting over all the sins that he was doing from drugs, sex, pornography. Uh, just listen to a second. Now he's this wonderful Catholic priest who's going around the world promoting the rosary because that was how he, that was the sword that he used to get over his addictions. You know, we can never forget, and I think probably the most important is Mother Mary's role in helping uh, uh, addictions, especially to pornography, right? She was chaste. And, you know, for all the people who struggle with it, pray to her for help. And on the right side, I have this uh, the Mary undoer of knots, right? It can feel like our knots, there's so many knots in our life, so many things that are wound up with, uh, whether it's sin, whether it's addiction, that Mary undoer of knots is a powerful prayer to help us get over it. Um, and, you know, the last one here is, you know, Our Lady of Light. This is, a, I just I actually found this yesterday. This was uh, it's called Our Lady of Light, and it, it's the help of the addicted. And it was actually painted by Brother Mikey O'Neill McGrath. He's an oblate of St. Francis de Sales. He, he wrote, uh, made this beautiful painting. Uh, it's of Mary holding a broken cocktail glass with three flowers in it, a lotus symbolizing enlightenment and beauty, a golden rose symbolizing the rosary, especially the mysteries of light, and a lily reminding everybody of the hope of Easter and the promise of a new beginning. I think this is the important part. There's always a new beginning. There's always a chance to get over whatever addiction it is. And really, Mary, the saints, our priests, confession, all these things, in addition to the medical help that we can do, can help us get over these. And I think it's a very important part. And the prayer uh, at the end is, you know, sister people who have fallen yet strive to rise again. A beautiful prayer and a beautiful way of doing it.
Um, you know, I, I won't, uh, this is just the I thirst prayer. Uh, you know, it's sort of long. I know it's been uh, quite a while, so I, I won't read it all to you. Uh, you can, Father Kevin, you can stop the sh screen sharing uh, if you want. But uh, you know, this is also a powerful prayer that it was one of the reflections that Mother Teresa wrote. Uh, and I think this was, it's just a, a beautiful way of showing us how much God uh, thirsts for us, how much God wants to heal us, and how much that, uh, you know, Jesus is sort of telling us that he wants to lift us up and bind uh, all the wounds for us. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end it there. Um, so great. And yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk is uh, very nice. So. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a very well-prepared session going from the science, the spirituality to the real practical experiences of people who have addictions and how to overcome them. Very, very good session. We're very blessed to have you uh, not only in Chicago, but the entire diocese. Uh, I know to find someone in the field of psychiatry who loves the faith as much as you do is, is hard to find nowadays, but uh, you are a great gift to the church, uh, your knowledge, your experience, and your passion for the faith. And I thank your parents for uh, giving you such a great Catholic formation education as well, uh, for helping you to become the Catholic man you are. And so uh, now we'll have some time for questions. Um, everyone is on mute, but if you want to type a question, you can type a question either to me or to Dr. Tom, or you can do it publicly for everyone to see. Um, Dr. Tom is a great resource. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer some questions. Uh, but if no one has any, has any questions, we could conclude, uh, or I may ask a question. So if you have any questions, please do write in the chat box. You can send it directly to Dr. Tom or directly to me, um, or in the, uh, or we can just conclude. So I'll ask you a question. Um, so you, you show that diagram of the brain from like someone who is smaller and all those different colors going to someone who's 20 and has like the full blue or I guess it's mature developed. And so um, you mentioned like, for example, in Kerala, you know, many times children experience alcohol at a very young age and sometimes the addiction can start there. Uh, in America, especially in terms of pornography addiction, I think the age in which someone encounters pornography in America, at least for boys is, I think 10 or maybe less than that. And so the addiction starts in that middle of that kind of diagram, or even sometimes before when those colors, when all that stuff is still developing. And so how would a pornography addiction at such a young age impact that person and their life onwards or any addiction? So if someone has a addiction as a child, you know, that's going to really affect the brain more than someone starting an addiction later on, I believe, or at least I would assume. Development period is very critical. It's like, you know, if you're raising a plant and you allowed weeds to go around it, well, that plant's going to be impacted by it. Um, you know, what we develop in our brain physically changes our brain. It sort of, it wires our brains to be used to certain things. So if we're used to good things, well, you're more likely to do good things. Uh, if we're wired, say, for pornography, you know, what is pornography? It is this absolute sort of desacralization of the marital act. And that could lead to significantly uh, misconstrued views of, well, what is an intimate relationship? How should I treat a man or how should I treat a woman? I, you know, how do I see the opposite sex? You know, it allows people to experience things that were otherwise reserved for marriage. It, it allows a, uh, people to sort of feel like, well, I've seen everything. I've sort of experienced everything. Well, what's left in life? And that's where that sort of hopelessness could definitely uh, come up uh, at, at times if that, you know, sort of an issue there. So, you know, we, we only learn very few ways, right? We learn only through our senses, our five senses. And sight is one of them, sounds are one of them, and all the other things that you know, are involved with that. Um, that part, I think, is important. So really trying to do things like basic things. Because someone had asked, uh, you know, how about, uh, like, how do you help children from, like, drugs and alcohol? But, you know, for the pornography, thing, have the computer out in public areas, you know. And it, it's harder with the phones, uh, but you could always put monitoring software. On there, you could see what websites your children are visiting. You could put uh, limits on those type of things to the best of your ability. And having honest conversations about what is the right way of seeing a man, a woman, what is the right way of seeing these things, you can never start too early. Uh, and really, you see a lot of just m sort of messed up views of sexuality. You see a lot of people being used uh, just because it's all about me, 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 and you don't get the true development uh, of that. Uh, intimate relationship, whether it's just in a friendship relationship, whether it's a dating relationship, or even a marital relationship. Um, oh, and so, hold on one second here. So someone had asked, uh, sorry, does that answer your question, Father Kevin? 
Yes, it does. Thank you. It does. I still wanted to ask, uh, see, what about other addictions like shopping and playing games? So yeah, so sh shopping, you know, it sort of follows the same uh, format in terms of addictions as all the other ones. Like you buy something, I feel great about it. Well, uh, I need to buy some more because you know, that feeling wore off. Like, so let me give a good example of cars, right? And uh, this is something I've said you know, other times before, but I sort of have to say it out there because this is a chronic problem that we face in the uh, Malayali churches. You know, I remember growing up, and you know the parking lot was just Hondas and Toyotas. That that's all it was. Now it's moved on to Lexuses, Mercedes. It's moved on and up and up. Even though the collections have stayed the same, that's a different story. Uh, but you know that, that's sort of the way of looking at it, right? Who we as people haven't changed. Our bodies haven't changed that much. We haven't suddenly gotten bigger or uh, you know needed all this extra luxury that comes with it. That, that's sort of this idea that well, I need better and better things. And Mother Teresa in one of her books, I think it was. Come be my light or no greater love. She has the best answer ever. She said a very rich woman had approached her. Uh, she said, you know, Mother Teresa, I have all these expensive saris, thousands and thousands of rupees. This was back in the 1980s. She was a very wealthy woman. And she said, Mother Teresa, I want to stop buying all these saris because this is something that I don't like doing, but I just need to keep buying these nicer and nicer saris. And what did Mother Teresa do? She did, I think, the most perfect way. She said, okay, well, instead of buying a 5,000 rupee sari, which is probably the equivalent of 50,000 rupees now, he said, buy a 4,000 rupee sari, and then go down by 1,000 rupees every single week until she finally got to the point of just buying the same type of 100 rupee sari that Mother Teresa was wearing. And so it's not about stopping things suddenly when it comes to shopping. It's about you know, knowing well, what's a need versus what's a want, or budgeting uh, is very important. You know, set aside some money every paycheck for things you want, whatever, according to your ability to be afforded set a little bit of sites for your own things. And, you know, but giving can also be a very powerful way of getting very positive experiences, but doing something good out of it. Uh, playing games, like I you know, discussed that, uh, you know, uh, you wanna be careful with how much game time, how much screen time you have. Uh, people have lived for thousands of years without TV or games and no one died from not having a game. <laughs> and some of it takes a little bit of, you just have to do it. Um, and uh, let's see here. So someone said, uh, let's see. Okay, so yeah, then, uh, you know, I appreciate this person for saying this. So this person mentioned that someone uh, said that, you know, marijuana is very safe to use. Uh, it's not going to hurt you and things like that. So you know, I, and I hear this from adults all the time, whether you're adults or child. Well, marijuana is natural. It's grown from a plant, right? It's not that processor. I get it from a medical dispensary that's regulated by the government. Uh, it, it, where it's made, what it does, doesn't make a difference. It still impacts the same neural tracts within the brain. It still raises the dopamine uh, at levels that are not appropriate for the brain. So, you know, that's a very common thing. What I would tell sort of someone like that is it's not safe regardless of who's doing it or what they call it or what they brand it as, because there's a lot of money um, that's being put into the marijuana industry. And a lot of uh, marijuana companies are publicly traded. They're on the stock market. You can literally buy stocks from them. So multi-billion dollar industries so there's gonna be a lot of things out there, but you know, what I would tell them is that no, marijuana is not safe because chemically how it's affecting your brain uh, is still bad. It's still negative and can still lead to addictions. Uh, and a lot of people will say, well, I'm only using marijuana to um, you know, deal with uh, my sleep or things like that. And I always tell people marijuana, the effect only lasts a few hours. If the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, looked at marijuana as any medicine that would be done by say a pharmaceutical company, they would never approve it. It wouldn't get approved because what drug should they approve that has all these negative consequences, has a risk for addiction, but only lasts for a few hours in your system. It, it would never get approved is what I sort of tell people for that. So thank you for that question. That's a very common one that comes up. Um, let's see here. So uh, someone's struggling with addiction, but don't want to admit it. How can you as a friend help them? That's also a very powerful question. That's a very painful place to be in, uh, to see someone struggling through an addiction who doesn't admit it. You know, really the, it comes down to is, you know, being, being there for them, finding out, you know, as friendly or as neutral of a way as you can, well, you know, what's this doing for you? Like, what's alcohol doing for you? What's the marijuana doing for you? And being there to listen, like spending time with them in non-substance related uh, ways. Just spending time with the person, being available to talk to someone can be a very, very powerful thing. Um, so say someone's using alcohol because they're just lonely, set up a time to talk to them. If someone's using alcohol to help them get to sleep, encourage them, well, let's deal with these in a safe way that's medically um, reasonable. So, 
Uh, what, what approach can be taken by parents? What are the symptoms parents need to watch out in their teenage children? Uh, so, you know, parents know their children the best. One, you got to sit down and talk to your children um, and get an idea of what's going on in their life. If you just ask them, are you using drugs? Most of them are going to say no, but you know, it couldn't hurt to say, well, you know, I've noticed you've changed a little bit, you know, you've been more irritable lately. Like what's going on? And trying to, as much as you can, build up a trusting relationship. That can take time, um, but you know, setting firm limits. Uh, we, had a, we have a lot of um, parents who just give money to their children without ever thinking about it. Well, what's the money being used for? Ha have your child prove, well, what are the, what's the money being used for? And help them track that. If there's something that they're dealing with, you have to be open to it. You have to be open to knowing that, oh, my child might not be perfect. My child might be struggling with things like depression, anxiety might have a lot of things that are going on in their life uh, that, you know, you just need to be able to talk to them, set aside time just to be with them, watch a movie with them that they like, even if you don't like it. And these are little ways that you sort of build up that relationship uh, between a parent and child. And uh, those are the type of things that, you know, if you're open, if you're open and your parent, your child at least can trust you a little bit, you know, they, they may be less likely to happen. So. Okay, that's all I see in the chat, so. Awesome. Good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tom, Tom Jordan, for your for your time. Uh, and uh, we uh, learned a lot, at least I learned a lot uh, from this talk. And I hope that for those who did uh, learn something, share it with your friends and family. And also, um, we will be posting the video link recording on our YouTube channel. So please do share it with your friends. And so uh, we wish you uh, all the best. And so God bless you in your occupation and your ministry. And I uh, hope to hear from you soon, too. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Nice seeing you again, Father. Thanks, everyone, for listening. It was nice talking. All right. So good night, everyone. God bless you. And uh, yeah, we'll see you another time.